Hi, I'm Steve Sandler, the founder of AEI Systems, a company that specializes in modeling, analysis, and simulation. A large part of our focus is on analog and power electronics, though we support RF and instrumentation as well, primarily for the high reliability arena. In our business, we are frequently called on to assess and troubleshoot system level issues, many of which are related to the power distribution network. The causes of customer issues are generally covered in this very short list. At AEI Systems, we frequently see system and power converter issues related to a converter's switching characteristics, which are most easily observed at the switching node. So in this video, we'll discuss the measurement and interpretation of switch node waveforms as observed in point-of-load regulators, or POLs. We'll discuss the instrumentation requirements for measuring switch node waveforms, why switch node waveforms should be viewed using different time scales, and the impact of scope probes on measurements. With those measurement requirements as background, we'll then examine how switching frequency and duty cycle affect power supply stability as well as EMI. In making switch node measurements, we've learned two interesting lessons. One is that the bandwidth and sample rate requirements for these measurements are much greater than most expect. We discussed this issue in an article titled Sharpen Rising and Falling Edges, where we showed the bandwidth required to measure the edge speed of a point of load regulator. Another lesson learned is that the pulse width of the switch node includes frequency and magnitude characteristics of the pulse jitter. In this video, we'll present examples demonstrating each of these points. We begin by looking at measurements taken on an LTC 3880 demo board, which contains a buck converter based on the LTC 3880 step-down controller IC. In this image, we show measurements of the buck converter switch node waveforms. These measurements are actually three views of the same waveform. In the first view, we show many pulses, so that we can see the uniformity between pulses. In the zoom view, we can see the ringing at the rising edge of the waveform, and in the third view, we are measuring the pulse width versus time, allowing us to see the changes in width and also the envelope of modulation. In this measurement, we zoom in on the leading edge of the switching waveform. The measurement of the switching edge is very difficult as the scope probe essentially looks like a capacitor at these switching speeds, while the probe tip and any lead lengths look like inductors at these switching speeds. In addition to these external effects, the probe also has a finite bandwidth limitation, as does the oscilloscope. This point-of-load regulator has an edge speed of approximately 1 nanosecond, as do many of the newer high-speed POL devices. Comparison measurements made using a 4 GHz scope at a 20 GHz sample rate with three probes shows that a 500 MHz leadless probe doesn't ring much, but results in a nearly 50% error in the rise time measurement. The addition of a ground wire causes excessive ringing at approximately 400 MHz, indicating that the probe does not support the specified 500 MHz bandwidth when the ground lead is used. Nevertheless, there's a slight benefit here. While it might be counterintuitive, the ringing actually results in a slight improvement in the rise time measurement. Finally, when we look at the 2.5 GHz active probe, we see that it does not ring at all and offers sufficient bandwidth. This probe also offers very low capacitance, greatly reducing the sensitivity of ground leads and traces. However, this probe is limited to plus or minus 8 volts with a plus or minus 12 volt offset, and like most active probes, is expensive. When I tell engineers that I want to look at their switching frequency and duty cycle to see if that's the root cause of their stability issues, I often get some very odd looks. However, there are several ways that the power supply's switching action interacts with its control loop, as we will soon see. These two Bode plots are from an LTC 3880 demo board. I liked working with this board as I could program the switching frequency independent of the control loop gain, output voltage, and compensation. In these Bode plots, we see gain and phase measured two ways. One set of curves is taken with the POL configured for a switching frequency of 250 kHz, while the other set of curves is taken with the POL switching at 500 kHz. In these images, we can clearly see a second-order filter pole at approximately 2.5 kHz, and we can also see the zero-order hold, or ZOH, 
that is characteristic of the switching converter. The zero order hold is responsible for the very rapid phase loss as we approach the switching frequency. Oddly, we can see the second order filter pole clearly as it is a current mode converter. This converter may be overslope compensated in order to minimize the excessive duty cycle jitter, which would explain the strong voltage mode tendency. Looking at these same two Bode plots in a Nyquist display, we can see the phase margin, gain margin, and stability margin. And most importantly, this plot also shows how the curve moves closer to the singular unstable point at 1,0 as the switching frequency is reduced. This is almost entirely due to the zero order hold, and it's a very common issue for DSP-based digital power supplies, since all digital loops are sampled. The lower the sample rate, or switching frequency, the longer the delay, and therefore the greater the phase shift. Now that we understand the impact of the zero-order hold on this POL stability, we can understand a subtlety of the output impedance curve we presented in an earlier video. Revisiting this impedance plot from part 4 of the video series, we can now explain why there's a peak occurring at approximately half the switching frequency. This anomalous peak in the impedance curve is caused by the zero-order hold's impact on the stability margin. We can also see why we like to perform measurements in pairs. Since the anomalous point is not seen in the off state, we know that its appearance relates to a true control loop issue. This type of stability issue is very common in converters where the bandwidth is pushed in an effort to optimize performance. This is also common for converters that enter pulse skipping modes, whether they do so intentionally or not. Generally, the stability margin dominates the performance under these conditions, and that is why most of the high-end motherboard manufacturers use very conservative crossover frequencies when designing their point of loads. Most switching converter topologies have modulator phase lag resulting from the sampling time delay. The sampling effect exists whether the converter is a digital PWM or an analog PWM. The point to remember is that designers should be aware of the existence of the zero-order hold in their converter designs, so they can watch for its effect on the converter's control loop stability. In testing another point of load model, we were very fortunate to have observed a direct manifestation of switching frequency effects due to point of load converter stability. When we tested multiple demo boards of the same part number and revision, we noted that some of the boards suffered from excessive frequency jitter, while others did not. The image on the left is the measurement of one point of load demo board that does not have significant jitter, though it shows ringing which is a representation of the converter's 20 degree phase margin. Meanwhile, in the image on the right, we see the measurement of a second point of load demo board. This demo board shows evidence of frequency jitter as a noisy plot, and occasionally the point of load will burst into oscillation as a result of a drop in switching frequency. We can generally measure this jitter using an oscilloscope, but for the higher fidelity measurement, we can use a signal source analyzer or phase noise analyzer to measure the jitter. This set of images shows both time domain and spectrum measurements of the switch node of the same two point of load demo boards measured in the previous slide. In the time domain measurements on top, the frequency jitter is easily seen in the board on the left, but not on the right. Then in the spectrum analysis measurements, we see the impact that the frequency jitter has on the EMI performance and also on the output ripple and noise from the point of load. These particular measurements were measured with direct connection to the switch node. However, in troubleshooting activities at AEI systems, we often find these types of issues first with a near-field probe and an EMI scan, which would reveal the same spectral content as a measurement taken directly at the switch node. For those interested in learning more about how to measure and interpret switch node waveforms, see the references listed here. And if you have any questions about the information presented here, please email me at steve at picotest.com. Thank you.